Good evening, everyone. Um, we apologize for our technical challenges. We're getting started a little late here, um, but glad folks were able to join us tonight um, and access um, our meeting here. Um, we had some difficulties at our last meeting in late January. Um, we had a very, very high amount of um, attendees, which caused some connectivity issues for folks. Um, and we worked with our IT teams at the city um, to troubleshoot those issues, um, as well as to um, accommodate all of our translation needs, um, and then had some additional uh, technical difficulties that uh, you saw us having today to get started. So we appreciate your patience so very much. Um, and we know that this is an um, important topic uh, to everyone. Um, so welcome um, and welcome to the second meeting um, of the Transforming Community Safety Informational Meeting. I am Jen White. I work in the Office of Violence Prevention um, as the project manager of the Transforming Community Safety Work. Um, and I welcome you all here. So first we will um, go over a couple kind of um, just general uh, I would like to refer to them as housekeeping, but I guess uh, notes um, to share with all of you. Um, we unfortunately will not be joined by our Office of Performance and Innovation this evening. Um, they had a family emergency um, and we're not able to be here. So we are happy to answer questions um, as they come up as we are able, um, but just know that we won't have them here on our agenda this evening. Um, we will also be welcomed by um, the director of the Office of Violence Prevention, um, Sasha Cotton, our um, assistant chief, uh, Henry Halverson from Minneapolis Police Department, um, Cheyenne Brodeen from Neighborhood and Community Relations, um, and we will be um, giving an overview of kind of the priority buckets, the pillars, what we refer to them as around the reimagined community safety work. We recognize that it is difficult um, for community members to imagine um, a new system. Um, so we have identified kind of three priority areas to help guide the work um, and the conversation. And some of this work um, has been ongoing at the city for some time. Um, so we wanted to bring that information out to you in an accessible way so that you can understand where things are at um, and also help uh, along with this process that we're on together. Um, so the overview of the, of the pillars, um, our first pillar is violence prevention. Um, and that has to do with um, how can we work to prevent violence, um, intervene when violence is happening and then support community members um, after violence has occurred. The second pillar um, is our alternative response to 911 calls. So that looks at what are what types of calls that we could consider alternative um, responders um, to to take um, to both like um, decrease the workload on our officers, but some of the um, other professionals that we have might be better equipped to respond to some of those calls. The city does have funding this year um, for a pilot project um, around a civilian mental health response. Um, and that will be um, evolving um, at, into late spring and early summer. So please stay tuned for updates on that. Um, and then the third pillar of this work is police policy reform. So how are we working with law enforcement um, in our police department um, uh, under the guidance of our y cómo estamos respondiendo to have the best um, policies and procedures for our officers so that they are showing up um, as best they can to support community um, with those calls. So those are kind of the three overview pillars. Um, we will hear from two of those three pillars um, tonight, as well as um, efforts around our community engagement from our community uh, neighborhood and community relations department. So first, I would like to turn it over to, um, oh, I'm sorry. And after that, we will do some Q&A. Apologize. We will have some Q&A. You are welcome to add your questions in the chat. Um, and we have staff that will be monitoring those. And we have pulled some as well that were sent in advance to our office. So now I will be turning it over to our director of the Office of Violence Prevention, Sasha Cotton, to talk a little bit more about that work. Good evening, everybody. As Jen said, my name is Sasha Cotton, and I'm the director of the Minneapolis Office of Violence Prevention. 
I'm going to do a little bit of a high level overview of our approach to violence prevention and what that means when we talk about it from a public health approach. Um, Minneapolis has been using the public health approach to think about violence prevention actually for some time. Although the office was developed in 2019, uh, under the Office of Violence Prevention's guise, we've really been pulling in the themes and practices of our previous work focused on youth violence prevention. And that work started with the Minneapolis Blueprint back in 2006. And so while the work continues to grow and evolve and certainly has been building in the last several years, this isn't something that's new in the city of Minneapolis. And what we mean by a public health approach is really thinking about how we can build out models that focus on looking at risk and protective factors, how we can test models to see if they are effective, models that are rooted in research, evaluate those models um, to see how they're working in Minneapolis, and then try to build on widespread adaptation if we find them to be effective at reducing violence. Um, violence prevention as a public health method is not, it's, it's a relatively old theory. It's something that we've been thinking about as a nation and as a system for some time. And when we think about it, we think about it in the same way that we think about the spread of COVID. We think about all epidemics um, with uh, that kind of lens in mind. And I use COVID as a reference because we are all so very familiar with COVID. And what we mean is that uh, proximity to the virus, whether that be the virus of violence or the virus of COVID is largely spread by contact. And so we really focus in the public health sector on mitigating the spread by evaluating how the virus is spread. In this case, we know that contact is the main culprit and mitigating the factors of that spread. So for violence, we look at things like exposure. If you're growing up in a neighborhood where violence is prevalent or a home where violence is prevalent, you will be more vulnerable to violence. That doesn't mean you will inherently be violent, but it does mean that you will have a higher likelihood or a higher predisposition potentially to involvement with violence, whether that be as a perpetrator, a victim, or both. And so we want to concentrate on communities where those things unfortunately are prevalent to really mitigate those things. We also want to look at other underlying social conditions or um, social norms that we know may contribute to violent behavior, things um, such as exposure to the criminal justice system. We know that those systems can often lead to recidivism. So we want to work with populations on the issue of reentry. Um, per the Department of Justice, we really like to think about our work in um, four key areas. So prevention, intervention, reentry, and enforcement are key parts of how we think about our work and the kind of some of the buckets that we put our work into. And then we also really focus on a tool called the prevention pyramid. And the prevention pyramid is a pyramid like we're all very familiar with. The base of that pyramid is primary prevention. And primary prevention really focuses on thinking about healthy, hopeful communities, communities that are thriving, um, good schools, high quality employment, good housing, stable neighborhoods, stable communities. And when we have those things, we know that violence is far less likely. So a key part of what we do in the Office of Violence Prevention is work on those things, both through policy and programming. The second tier of our pyramid, of the prevention pyramid, is what we would call secondary prevention or what many people think of as intervention. This is working again in those most high risk communities where we think that violence um, and exposure to violence might be more common than it is in other places and really working to address some of those underlying conditions as well as intervening at the first sign of violence or predisposition to violence. And then the third and very top tier of the pyramid is what we call tertiary prevention. And tertiary prevention is really focused on that recidivism or that cycle of violence and wanting to interrupt that cycle of violence. And many of our programs in the Office of Violence Prevention that are focused on gun violence focus specifically on tertiary violence. And that again is focused on trying to interrupt the pattern when someone has already been hurt by violence, trying to convince them that retaliation is not an effective strategy to resolve their concerns and really trying to help them get their life on, in a trajectory that moves them away from violence and towards stability and peaceful community. And so I think that um, that is some context. We have a number of PowerPoints that talk about this that are in our limb system and give a deeper analysis. But I think that that provides a high level overview of the general philosophy of the public health approach to violence prevention. So I will kick it back to Jen. Thank you.
Thanks, Sasha. Um, and apologize, I was not able to unmute myself. Um, we appreciate that overview. Um, I know someone put in the chat that we were speaking a little too quickly, um, and I apologize for that. Uh, it was likely me who started off um, at that quick pace, noting that we got a little bit of a late start. Um, so just wanted to uh, be mindful of that, and I appreciate um, that request to ask us to slow down. Um, so next we will have kind of an overview um, of some of the policy reforms that are happening um, in MPD. Um, and for that, I would like to invite uh, Assistant Chief Halverson to speak a little bit um, to some of the current reforms uh, that we're working on. Yes, hello, uh, hello everybody. Uh, Jen, I appreciate the, uh, the time and the opportunity to come talk. So um, at the last meeting we had, we talked, I had uh, um, discussed some of the policy changes that we had uh, um, addressed in the last several years. Um, but uh, this time I thought I would focus on a little bit more of um, uh, some of the other transformational changes we're trying to make within the department that um, um, maybe don't specifically touch on policy, but um, some uh, uh, different ways that we are trying to uh, make some changes within uh, the, the organization. So uh, so first thing I'd like to touch upon is our recruitment efforts. So uh, we have been authorized to uh, um, hire uh, several classes this year for 2021. Uh, we began first with a class of uh, um, uh, uh, recruits that we had um, uh, let go back in September of last year. We have brought those uh, those people back. Uh, they are currently in the uh, Recruit Academy. Uh, that is uh, approximately 19 officers that we are training to uh, become recruit officers out on our street. Uh, we've also been authorized to hire uh, another class of recruits in the summer, which is um, uh, we're looking at approximately 48 to 49 officers we will be uh, uh, hiring during that class, uh, uh, along with a class of cadet. The cadet program has been a very successful program for us um, since uh, back in the early 90s, uh, and we've been authorized to be able to um, um, uh, hire 20 cadets uh, in the end of the year. So the cadet program is a little different process for people to be police officers. It takes uh, people who are in different uh, um, uh, different lines of work, um, different professionals who have a little bit more life experience, uh, and we hire them to come uh, be police officers, basically get them their law enforcement degree um, and use their life experience to um, um, hopefully enhance their ability to be uh, sworn employees. Uh, along with that, we are also um, uh, been authorized to hire back some of our uh, community service officers. This again has been a great program for us. Um, it's been a very diverse program to where we've been able to um, cultivate a lot of uh, younger um, people who are interested in law enforcement, get them interested in law enforcement by uh, working uh, within the department and learning uh, about the department uh, by, um, um, by working the precincts or working in different units um, uh, along with at the same time getting their education in law enforcement and, and um, the, the, the goal in the CSO program is to continue with that with their education, with their learning and to eventually transition them to become um, police officers for the uh, city of Minneapolis. So um, along with this, uh, uh, this ability to hire, we've really um, taken uh, um, information from the uh, or changes from the Police Reform Act, uh, which was enacted by um, uh, state statute back in September of 2020 last year, uh, that allows departments or allows cities to um, uh, 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 use incentives for hiring. So um, while we cannot authorize or cannot um, um, uh, can't have people make a requirement to live within a city, we can still now use incentives for hiring. So for example, uh, some, of the, some of the things we look for is we look mm -hmm. for, uh, put an emphasis on volunteerism um, within different organizations throughout the, the city or throughout the state. 
uh, um, we put a premium on uh, language, being able to speak different languages um, to be able to respond and uh, deal with the different communities we have within uh, Minneapolis. Um, uh, and uh, we've used these to assist in, in, in giving uh, a little bit more um, ability for candidates to um, use some of these uh, different talents they have to improve their status or, or ability to, to continue to be hired um, or in the hiring process. Uh, um, another part of this is we have uh, focused on trying to get Minneapolis residents. Again, um, we, we try to get people who maybe have lived in the city, uh, try to put some emphasis on that uh, importance of of being within a city, of serving within the city, uh, and again, try to use that that uh, um, part to give them a little bit more, um, um, uh, a little bit more ability to uh, be able to finish that that role to be hired. Uh, along with this, we have a uh, actually have uh, for the first time for a while, I've had a sergeant to be able to specifically focus on recruitment. Uh, working with different partners within the city, uh, different enterprises within the city to try to focus on um, hiring some uh, diversity through uh, with candidates, um, going out to different, uh, targeting different uh, uh, events, different locations uh, to try to spread the word and, and try to get out there and, and um, um, reach out to some of our uh, um, people that we are looking to uh, try to um, add to the city of Minneapolis. So a second thing I thought I would touch on that I think would be important is the um, um, is the idea or thought of assisting or having the city attorney's office assist um, with internal affairs investigations. So um, um, uh, too often we've uh, unfortunately have been um, working through this process with the city attorney's office and they've been included on the back end of these cases um, but uh, working through uh, um, with the mayor's office and the city attorney's office uh, we've identified some possible um, um, process improvements uh, to include the city attorney's office uh, with uh, addressing these cases and working these cases um, and to hear from them um, on, on, on different perspectives or different things that we may miss. Um, so uh, we now currently have a city attorneys uh, um, embedded uh, with the internal affairs unit uh, to work with them on uh, addressing any uh, complaints that come up, uh, on addressing um, any questions during the investigations uh, or um, um, addressing any issues that may happen during the investigation. Uh, it's a, a new process um, and it's still kind of working itself out, but uh, um, we, we feel very, uh, we feel very good with the partnership that we've had with the city attorney's office. And uh, we feel that it's gonna be a great um, uh, assistance of us to uh, one, um, get these cases completed a little bit quicker and to ensure that um, uh, uh, any issues that, that may come up um, at a later date for possible grievance or arbitration uh, will be addressed uh, by, uh, with the assistance of the city attorney's office um, as they deal with a lot of these uh, arbitration cases on the back end of these cases and have some good history. Um, so those are the two issues I want to talk about and uh, um, I will turn it back over to Jen. Thank you for that, Chief. Um, appreciate that kind of overview. And um, I know that there are questions coming in the chat, um, as well as some that were emailed in advance. So we are going to kind of work our way through these presentations, um, and then we will begin responding to the questions just to let folks know um, where we're at um, and how we'll be responding to some of those. Um, and kind of next on our agenda um, is around um, that first phase of engagement um, and what we heard back um, through the various methods that we used um, 
which was, you know, the survey online, which is still um, open and available um, for folks to engage with. Um, we had some stakeholder interviews, focus groups, um, and then we pulled that data together um, in a report that we presented to the council um, on January 21st. Um, and that link we can share with you all as well. Um, but for that, I would ask Director Cotton just to give us a really broad overview of kind of what we heard um, from that first phase of engagement. Um, and then I will turn it over after that to um, Cheyenne Brodeen from Neighborhood and Community Relations to talk a little bit more um, in depth on that. So Director Cotton. Thank you, Jen. Um, yes, so we have created a community engagement strategy that tries, uh, especially during COVID, to do its best to, to reach out to the community to get input and feedback about reimagining public safety. And I think the language we've been trying to use uh, lately is really that we're in a phase of trying to reimagine what public safety could look like in Minneapolis. And we're hoping to develop recommendations, get feedback from community, as well as from national experts and models that have been used across the country so that we can then begin to transform public safety here in Minneapolis. And we know that this is gonna be a process and we're really very much in this phase at the beginning of that process. And so I'm gonna give a little bit of an update about um, the phases of our engagement. And then I'll let Cheyenne talk a little bit about the, in sort of the outcomes related to the engagement that has happened with community because NCR has really been at the helm of focus groups and engagement on this process. So the first phase of engagement, excuse me, just give me one second to get uh, my information pulled up here from my own notes. So we did use a mixed method approach um, for our engagement strategy. We used surveys, stakeholder interviews, policymaker interviews, engagement sessions, and research. Using a mix of different methods is helpful um, it, in giving participants a voice and ensuring that findings are grounded in participants' experiences. It captures different perspectives and when taken together allows for a more complete picture of the current situation. It should also help to identify consistent themes across a diverse community like we have in Minneapolis. So method one um, was really our survey and we did collect um, just under 10,000 surveys um, at our last poll, which was back in January. We know that we've received additional ones and we'll be monitoring and um, evaluating those surveys um, on a you know, ongoing basis to get that information. So please feel free to go and check out the survey and fill it out, give us that feedback. It is a really easy and direct way to provide some insight. Um, it doesn't take very long. The next phase of our engagement has been key stakeholder interviews. And for that process, we used what's called a snowball process. So we did provide some initial names um, to help our research partners get started with talking with folks in the community. But from those names, additional names were given. So when they spoke with those additional, those initial stakeholders, uh, names were given, and then those uh, folks were asked to give additional names. And so, sorry, I just need to pull up uh, another note here. So apologize why I take turn my screen off for just a second. Um, so snowballing is really a way to get a broad range of stakeholders involved in the interviewing process. And that is the method that we use. Interviews were conducted primarily in November and December, and they were one hour semi-structured interviews. And they were done with organizations like neighborhood orgs, business associations, uh, organizers, BIPOC community, <laughs> public safety advocates, faith communities and other cultural organizations. Method three was our policymaker interviews. This was really capturing input from our policymakers at the city because we knew that starting in June and even before they were getting lots of input and insight from their community and constituents about public safety and concerns and things that residents wanted to see change. And so these interviews were conducted to gather as much of that information as possible so that it could also be taken into consideration as we come up with recommendations for this plan. Method four was the engagement sessions, and that is really the area that Cheyenne will focus her conversation on, so I'm not gonna speak too much to that. And then method five was research, and that was really looking at existing models of community-based violence prevention, identifying existing models of responses that can serve as alternatives to police response, and exploring which of these models may, most, may, may be most suitable for implementation here in Minneapolis. 
um, research and resource assistance reviewed scientific literature, media, and public websites to identify public health and violence prevention alternative models. The team classified these programs into model types and captured model structures. And the team also captured illustrative information on jurisdictions that have announced intent to implement alternative models in the months since the killing of George Floyd. And so at this point, I'm gonna pause and ask Cheyenne to jump in and talk a little bit more about the engagement sessions that NCR led on this project. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. Um, thanks again, my name is Cheyenne Brodeen and I am with uh, the Neighborhood and Community Relations Department. And as Sasha mentioned, you know, this effort is really, you know, have produced a multi-pronged approach to engagement strategies and NCR, its main role was to uh, make sure that voices um, who maybe typically don't connect in through the, you know, to uh, a city survey or in other um, of the stakeholder groups that Sasha mentioned to make sure that their voices were included in this process. So we held uh, some focus groups. There were about 18 of them within uh, communities, the American Indian community, the African American community, the Southeast Asian community, the East African community, Latino community, the uh, LGBTQIA plus and trans communities, as well as the disability and aging communities. And um, from those conversations, we uh, had about seven main themes that um, were common throughout. And I am just pulling up my document, but I will uh, go through what those themes were so folks have an idea of what we what we uh, heard from these groups. Um, so the one of the themes was effectiveness and quality around community safety services. Folks felt the need for a fair, friendly, respectful, and timely services that de-escalate conflict. Residents should be taken seriously and get the help they need. Uh, racism, bias, and militaristic militaristic attitudes seem firmly entrenched in current responses. Uh, relationship building, um, officers, police leadership, and others in communities in the community safety system and city leaders should personally invest time connecting with community and work with community leaders. Um, the city should pay community for their ideas and fund communities equitably, more open, regular, and clear communication from the city. Uh, alternatives, the next theme is alternatives to police responders, uh, use for issues like mental health crises, homelessness, behavior issues with children, uh, concerned citizen calls, report taking complaints, non-dangerous situations, domestic violence and sexual assault, um, and culturally specific responders should be available for incidents that take place within or impact cultural communities. Uh, the next theme is violence prevention. Uh, some things we heard here were focus on young people, make positive alternatives to, to violence and gang membership, and bring back the Police Activities League. Uh, fund community organizations who do this work. Um, and the, there, this came out, um, I think, in multiple sessions, but uh, meet communities members' basic needs, financial resources, jobs, food, housing, employment, addiction support and uh, empower, train, and support community members to be engaged in violence prevention, uh, emotional health, and personal development. The next theme, uh, police misconduct and accountability, uh, abuse of power, reliance on using force, racism, and bias is a problem. Uh, police should always de-escalate and use non-lethal weapons. Uh, the next, uh, theme is demographics of responders. The city should hire and promote uh, to leadership more multilingual, racially diverse responders who live in Minneapolis. And the last theme we heard is uh, training for community safety responders. Officers should receive training around mental health, de-escalation, working effectively with cultural communities, alternatives to use force and handling language and accessibility barriers. Um, so overall, those were the seven themes we heard, and uh, we just wanted to make sure that uh, we reported out what we heard from those conversations um, in order to bring those uh, voices um, 
forward. So thank you. Thank you for that, uh, Cheyenne and Director Cotton. Um, good to just level set and give us a little bit of an overview about where some of the work is at. Um, and now I think it would be great if we could um, turn and respond to some of the questions that we've been receiving. Um, I appreciate folks who are adding um, their questions in the chat. Um, we've got staff monitoring those. I'm trying to look at those and pull them as I'm able as well. Um, and um, some that were emailed um, and are currently still being emailed that our staff are sharing with me too. Um, one of the questions that we did receive in advance um, was around um, the whole notion of um, centering um, specific community voices. Um, and I wanted to take a moment to respond to that. Um, the question really was centered around um, the legality of doing that. Um, and, and is it constitutional um, for the city to say that we are going to um, center certain voices over others? Um, so I, I, I did wanna take a moment um, to respond. Um, and so while um, I was not the author of that resolution um, that directed um, this work to begin around this engagement process, um, and I am also not a policymaker, um, but I believe that when the phrase center voices is used, it is meant to create space to ensure that people who've historically been marginalized um, or denied access um, to government and other institutions have an opportunity to participate and weigh in. Um, and really it's meant to be a signal um, to communities that have been and continue to be denied access um, in many institutions across our country um, and in our state. Um, specifically as evident by the persistent and ongoing racial disparities that we have. Um, and in Minnesota um, in particular, um, we kind of toggle between being the worst or the second worst or you know, kind of near the bottom for our racial disparities. So really um, it's not to give preference to any voices over another, it's just really to signal um, that we welcome everyone into this conversation um, and, and you know, I also feel that, you know, the unspoken exclusion of marginalized communities has been woven so deeply um, into the fabric of our culture um, that it somehow feels wrong um, even for us to say that we are going to be intentional um, around making sure that we're including everyone um, at the table, which also I think signals um, why it's important um, to say that. Um, that. That being said, we certainly do not give any greater weight to any one voice um, in this conversation, we absolutely acknowledge that there is a wide range um, of perspectives um, and feelings um, about this and that it is very, very personal for people. Um, and everyone's experiences are different. Um, we as a city have um, stated that racial equity is a goal of ours. Um, as a city, and we cannot work towards that um, if we are afraid to confront it um, and intentionally say that we are going to do all that we can to welcome those who have historically been excluded. Um, so again, it doesn't mean that we, you know, give preference to anyone. We just really want to make sure that we are creating space um, for everyone to be in this conversation. Um, so I wanted to answer that one. Um, another big question I think that um, has come up many times um, for us in the Office of Violence Prevention, um, but also were submitted to the community safety email are um, around the interrupters. I think that there has been um, a little bit of confusion maybe um, as to their purpose um, and kind of what happened um, when they were, um, um, pulled back a little bit during the cold winter months. Um, so I would like to invite Dr. Uh, Director Cotton just to speak a little bit more about the interrupters um, and where we're at currently and what our plans are for 2021. Thanks for that, Jen. So yes, I think um, the interrupter work is really an important part of the portfolio and developing portfolio of the Office of Violence Prevention. Uh, we've been really trying to think about our work uh, as it's developing in three key streams, one of which is lifting up nationally um, evaluated evidence-based practice models. And so 
Right now we're implementing three of those strategies, one of which um, is, and the newest of them, is the Cure Violence Replication, also known as the Interrupters, or the Minneapolis Strategic Outreach Teams. Uh, Cure Violence is a national best practice. It's been um, evaluated a number of times and has been shown to be very effective at reducing uh, gang and gun violence specifically in urban density communities. As it pertains to the implementation here, in 2020, uh, the Minneapolis City Council moved to allocate some money to the Office of Violence Prevention to pilot uh, the notion of interrupter teams. We did work uh, preliminarily with Cure Violence to establish uh, the ideology of that work and uh, begin to think about what it could look like in Minneapolis while we established teams and started to get frontline workers out engaging with uh, those most at risk for being involved with gang and group violence. In 2021, um, we do still have some teams that are assembled and are available to be activated in the event of a need, but during these cold winter months, especially with COVID, where it's very difficult for them to do their work indoors, we um, did sort of uh, roll back the program a little bit and are actually launching um, the, the new version or the updated version of that work on, on RFP basis. And so teams that are currently active are certainly eligible to apply, but we'll be expanding the number of teams that we have through this RFP. Uh, it will be a competitive bid process and we are working um, very closely in partnership with Care Violence to do the methodology from start to finish with them um, now that we're in full implementation and not just piloting. So what we learned in 2020 is that there's deep need for community interrupters, that our gang and gun violence continues to be a problem here, and that having outreach teams that are working on a day-to-day -day basis in community is critically important. And now we're going about doing the heavy lift of implementing this model using the evidence base that is rooted in the model that's been established by Cure Violence for over uh, two decades. And we're really looking forward to the measurable outcomes that we'll be able to evaluate, hopefully at the end of this year, once we have a notable amount of data and are able to capture that based on um, the way that Care Violence has designed that model. So we are meeting with them on a weekly basis. They are anticipated to be here on the ground in late March um, to really begin to evaluate the, the teams that apply and help us with the selection process. So we're really excited about it. It is a new and evolving body of work, but something that Minneapolis has been thinking about for a number of years, and we're very excited to see it come to full fruition in 2021. So I, with that, Jen, I will pause and uh, kick it back to you for any additional questions. Great, thank you. Um, and I think uh, there might be a couple follow-ups. So before you run away too quickly, um, we'll invite you back just for a couple clarifying um, questions and follow-ups here. Um, I think that there was a question that I just saw around um, the current work um, that the teams are doing um, with CANDU um, and Corcoran Neighborhood. Um, and I know that we were recently ex um, extending those contracts just to have some continuity um, while we get the work moving for um, 2021 um, so that those groups can be deployed um, as needed. Um, another question um, I think was around um, differentiating um, the interrupters um, versus one of the other RFPs um, that will be coming out soon, and that is to uh, provide that kind of neighborhood and community level supports um, during and after the trial. Can you just maybe speak a little bit about that, Sasha, um, what the difference is um, between the two? Sure. So I'll address the, first, the, la the, the last question first, and then I'll come back um, to the, the additional question. So there are currently two RFAs um, that have some parallels. One is the interrupter RFP, which is currently out. It is a competitive bid process for uh, agencies. Uh, to hello? Hello? Can you what? all hear me? OK. Um, it is a competitive bid process for agencies to apply to host an interrupter team. Interrupters are focused specifically on interrupting group and gang violence and working with demographics at most risk of being involved with that kind of violence. The RFP that many of you may have heard in the public safety committees and other meetings related to uh, outreach teams for um, the Derek Chauvin trial 
is really focused on crisis and trauma response during the trial. So recognizing that during the unrest of 2020, many communities experienced significant trauma and that there wasn't always a clear linkage between the communities and the cities, we are funding community-based organizations to do street outreach as well as engagement to ensure that communities both know what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis um, and can provide information about what's happening with the trial, but can also help to do de-escalation and conflict resolution and trauma work with individuals and communities that are experiencing um, any unsettling or challenges um, as we face some of the things that are gonna come into our communities during the trial. We know that um, trauma is often triggered and that the trial may trigger some residual trauma in individuals and in communities. And we wanted to be mindful of that and have community folks who already do this kind of work, who are trusted by community, be able to do that kind of work and be paid by the city to do that kind of engagement. Um, going back to the question about, I believe it was about Corcoran and Candu, the pilot um, for the interrupter work was housed in neighborhood associations. And so both of those organizations hosted teams during our pilot phase in 2020. And so those would be the resources that were allocated to them. It was for that purpose. Thanks for that, Sasha. Um, and I think there may have been one more follow-up um, on the interrupters, and then I'm going to maybe switch over um, a little bit. Um, and that is just around um, why they were pulled back during the winter months. And um, I apologize if I missed this while you were speaking, but I can just answer that really quickly. Um, you know, normally we would have had them meeting with community members and young people indoors, um, but due to the constraints of COVID, um, we just decided that would not be a great idea um, to having, you know, large groups of outreach staff um, and community members um, meeting indoors uh, during winter. Um, but we certainly do plan on having, you know, once once the model um, is fully up and operational that um, these teams will be, you know, working um, as we're able, um, provided that, um, you know, situations around COVID um, and safety precautions that we need um, will be shifting. Um, I think we're all kind of hoping for that this year um, that we'll, you know, be able to relax some of the restrictions, um, but we also always have to be putting um, everyone's health and safety um, as the primary focus of everything that we do. Um, so I would like to shift a little bit here. Um, one of the questions that came in um, that was emailed in advance was around um, the police union. Um, and I would invite uh, Chief Halverson um, to speak to this question. Um, so now that Bob Kroll has retired, what is the city of Minneapolis going to do about the police union moving forward? Chief, can you respond to that, please? Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks, Jen, for that question. So, um, uh, so you know, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of uh, control over who was in that role. Um, but again, uh, I, I think our interaction with them, we definitely have that control. So um, now that uh, Bob Cole is gone, the, um, the vice president, uh, um, Sergeant Cheryl Schmidt is her name. She had become the interim president um, of the police federation. Um, and uh, we um, have had a very good relationship with her. Um, uh, we have now uh, again interacted with them to um, um, have the the chief now is again back into uh, uh, negotiations with them over a collecting bargaining agreement um, we have had um, uh, meetings with the police federation labor management meetings regarding issues that come up so um, it, it's going to be a different relationship that is going to move forward with the police federation um, and, and we're hoping that it's going to be uh, uh, one that is, is going to be able to um, foster some good, some good discussions, uh, some good interactions, um, and, and some um, um, good assistance from the Federation um, to assist in this transformational process of the police department.
Thanks, Chief. Um, just was waiting to be able to unmute myself there. Um, so not going to let you run away too quick. Sorry, um, we've got another question for you. Um, how will the training of the new cadets and recruits emphasize the sanctity of human life and the dignity of all people versus the warrior um, ideology? Uh, yeah, so uh, another good question. I touched on this in our last uh, um, meeting we had is that, um, you know, we've really, um, um, I think, uh, in the last several years, um, uh, a lot of uh, law enforcement agencies have really moved away from that mentality of that warrior mentality. So we, in fact, went uh, forth and banned any type of warrior type training for our employees. Um, you know, we're taking more of that mindset of the guard guardian mentality. Um, um, and um, trying to uh, refocus on that. So our, our new cadet or our new recruits that start uh, will go through um, a kind of modified training, uh, uh, focusing on, on, on bringing that uh, guardian mentality um, and, and realizing that we are um, the, the stewards of, of uh, this new line of thinking of, of the guardian, guardian idea uh, that we will, um, uh, uh, kind of focus on um, not only uh, being the guardians of, 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 the, of the city and, and our employees, but also um, guardians of our employees because they, they also were focusing a lot more on wellness for our employees to realize that uh, we have to have them in a good mind, a good state uh, um, to be able to respond to certain incidents, to be able to respond to calls um, uh, and to be able to have that focus that we're asking them to. So um, we've really uh, kind of changed a little bit of our training to, to along with uh, um, changing that mindset to focus on the wellness of our employees. Thank you, Chief. Um, and not to keep putting you on the spot here, um, but I just have a couple more I think that um, you can respond to rather quickly. Um, one is around um, the, um, we have a large population in Minneapolis of, of unhoused um, folks. Um, what is being done so that they are cared for um, and not jailed um, or imprisoned? Okay, I uh, got it muted here. So um, uh, another great question. So I can tell you that the, the chief has really uh, focused on um, this, this um, issue uh, in our response to it. Um, so we had our homeless um, uh, kind of uh, um, encampment team that were uh, focused on addressing these issues. Uh, we realized that, that um, we are not um, trying to criminalize homelessness. A lot of different factors go into that. So um, we've come up with different responses to homelessness uh, in our, um, uh, our homeless um, kind of, uh, our homeless encampment team has really worked on finding resources to uh, assist these people uh, with either maybe social services or finding them um, different uh, uh, places to stay, different places to go and uh, live. So. Um, no, we, we, we really uh, moved away from that uh, criminalizing homelessness and, and trying to find uh, different resources we can do to help, different resources we can do to assist uh, these people who are, are, are going through these difficult times. Thank you, Chief. I uh, appreciate that response there. Um, let's gonna go through here. Um, I believe that um, Director Cotton can handle this one. Um, what public safety models um, and or the chief, this could be for both of you actually, um, and maybe I'd like to invite both of you to respond. Um, what public safety models from other cities and states are being followed? Sorry, just so you all know, we have to be unmuted. So it takes us a minute. It may seem like we're stalled for a second, and that's why. Um, so I did begin to talk a little bit about the fact that in the Office of Violence Prevention, we're really trying to focus on part of our work on evidence-based practice. And so we do have three models that are really rooted in evidence-based and that are supported by 
the Department of Justice, the CEC, Health and Human Services, as well as a number of institutions of research and universities. Those are the Group Violence Intervention, which is actually a partnership with the Minneapolis Police Department, the Office of Violence Prevention, and currently our um, community partner is North Point. And the focus of that work is really on um, individuals who are involved in gang activity who are at greatest risk of being involved in a shooting as a perpetrator or a victim and who need immediate assistance to mitigate those circumstances. So really operating in crisis, not necessarily always focused on long-term services, but really trying to interrupt that in the moment crisis of a shooting. Uh, the next one is our Next Step program, which is a hospital-based model. And it is a bedside intervention that we offer to anyone who comes into our Trauma One centers, which is HCMC and North Memorial. We'll be expanding to Abbott um, this year. Anyone who comes into those hospitals with a serious injury from violence, so whether that be a gunshot wound, a stabbing, or other serious assault, gets an immediate intervention. And we know that nationally, about 40% of people who come into an emergency room with those kinds of injuries will come back to an emergency room in that first year with a same or similar injury. Participants in the Next Step program, we've seen those numbers drop to under 10% in the years that we've been implementing that program with participants in that program. So we do feel like we're seeing um, some real trends in the right direction with participants in that program. And what we offer is an immediate bedside intervention because we know that with modern medicine, which is such a gift, a lot of the times people are patched up and sent home with serious gunshot wounds or other injuries in a matter of hours and their lives are saved, which is a gift, but no one is asking the really difficult question of, how did this happen? Why did it happen? Is it safe for you to go home? Do you have home to go back to? Um, and really thinking about all of the things that could bring a person to the point where they are a victim of violence and also wanting again to mitigate that retaliatory violence. We know that hurt people often hurt people and that they may be feeling an inclination to go out and retaliate for the violence that they've experienced themselves. And so really also a big part of the focus of Next Step is that retaliation. And then the third evidence-based model that we're lifting up in the OVP is the care violence work of the interrupters, which I mentioned before, and that's the newest iteration of our evidence-based work. And I will pause and see if the chief has other things that he wants to highlight from the MPD. Yeah, thank you for that, Sasha. I, I agree totally on, on those things you had addressed. Um, uh, we've seen some real good success with some of those programs. Uh, I, I guess on the on the more a little bit more on the police side, I would I would. Uh, talk about some of the um, different ways we're going about addressing um, uh, kind of that public safety model is, you know, the chiefs really put a, tried to put a focus on, on that uh, community engagement. So we had the community engagement team um, um, going, uh, going out and, and touching uh, base with different, uh, um, different diverse communities throughout our community um, or throughout the city. Uh, along with that, um, he had. The, we still have the navigators who are civilian employees that work with the police department that go out and um, um, uh, uh, work with different uh, diverse communities throughout the city of Minneapolis uh, to to give that uh, um, uh, civilian perspective on uh, addressing the concerns or needs of our uh, citizens. Um, um, and then I would also go on uh, that we are really. I think a, a lot of these things that we're talking about is is not so much that we are following public safety models, but I think we're really a, a ahead of the curve that we're above it with all these uh, um, different programs we're talking um, about. And then along with that, the training of our officers. So our officers also have received the implicit bias training uh, in being able to deal with um, um, understanding their own uh, biases when they are uh, uh, working with people, when they're uh, out dealing with citizens in, in the community, uh, along with their procedural justice aspect. We we're one of six cities uh, um, throughout the nation that really um, embraced um, the procedural justice model, which um, uh, there's four core components uh, that uh, allow us to get that legitimacy um, um, with the community. Um, by giving them a voice, uh, by being neutral, um, by um, gaining that trust and being respectful. So um, uh, I would say there's things that we are really at the forefront as opposed to uh, following other models throughout other cities. Oh, 
Thank you for that, Chief. Um, I wanted to shift gears a little bit um, and um, there is um, a couple of questions I think that I can just field myself um, really quickly. Um, one of the questions was around um, from, from the last meeting um, that was uh, asked in the chat around the mayor's um, task forces um, and the third task force table in particular around community engagement um, and what happened to that. Um, so at the time, um, I was working in the mayor's office as a public safety policy aide, um, supporting him. Um, and I have since shift now over to the Office of Violence Prevention. And since the city has moved to um, a broader citywide engagement plan, um, we have just folded that work um, with the community um, into our plans here and how we're engaging um, community here um, going forward um, with this process. Um, I hope that is um, response to that question a little bit. Um, I'm trying to keep up a little with some of these that are coming in um, through there. Um, and a follow up to that, um, asking why folks are only able to answer or ask questions in the chat um, um, in this meeting. Um, and that is just due to the large um, number of participants. Um, and we wanted to allow folks to have the opportunity to engage, um, but it can get a little crazy um, if everyone was able to unmute and ask questions um, as they need to. Um, we are planning on having some, some more, more topical, smaller engagement circles um, where we will be able to have more of kind of like that dialogue um, with folks. So we will be sure to share that um, um, as those opportunities um, are coming forward. We recognize this is not the best platform either. Um, and, and in a pre or post COVID realm, we would likely be meeting um, in a community center um, or in a gym somewhere um, and, and be having a much more interactive experience um, to be asking questions um, and, and responding to them um, um, in a much more direct and interactive way. So we appreciate everybody's patience um, with us here um, as we work with uh, this virtual realm that we all live in now. Um, another one of the questions um, I think that folks have been asking about um, in, in recent days um, is around the difference between um, the funding that the city um, was going to use to um, engage um, social media influencers um, around the pre-trial um, engagement versus um, the money set aside for the more community level groups um, who will be providing that support um, in community. Um, and the decision to pull back on um, that uh, social media influencers um, path. So while this was not um, something that came directly from our office in the Office of Violence Prevention, um, I do have some knowledge of it and just want to put it out there um, for everyone um, just to level set. Um, so I think the idea around it was to, you know, use some of these credible messengers to help get the word out about, you know, a range of topics um, during the trial. Um, and, you know, there was um, kind of some negative feedback that we heard um, and, and, and even in some ways um, caused some harm um, that was not intended um, at all um, on behalf of anyone at the city. Um, so the decision around this was just to pull, pull that back um, and Director David Rubador of our Neighborhood and Community Relations Department did speak on this um, during the briefing uh, to council that happened yesterday morning. Um, and we can provide that link to you all as well um, if you'd like to look back and um, watch that um, meeting. So just wanted to um, give a little bit more information there um, and that decision um, and, and why it was made. Um, we certainly all as um, you know, city public servants never ever wanna cause harm um, to folks who we are serving in our community. Um, so we do appreciate everyone's feedback um, and want to just make sure that we are um, using a variety of methods to engage, but also that we're um, providing engagement um, that is um, wanted um, and provides um, positive outcomes um, to, you know, residents and visitors and everyone else here. Um, so that's uh, kind of what I wanted to say on that. 
Um, and I will ask another question of the chief. Um, and that is um, around some of the safety challenges that uh, community is experiencing right now in the city um, with respect to, um, in particular, carjackings and things like that. Um, folks are asking kind of what uh, the plan is um, and how MPD is responding um, to some of our urgent safety concerns. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, we have, uh, I could tell you that um, we put our focus back on, uh, you know, primarily just with our resources because they uh, um, have diminished as, as I think has been publicly um, documented. Um, we've really put the focus back on uh, public safety uh, so ensuring that we have the resources out there to respond to um, uh, to crime uh, incidents that are happening. Happening. So we we're ensuring that at the precinct level we have the officers to respond and, and be out there to um, uh, try to assist our communities uh, that are victims of these these types of incidents. Uh, um, along with that, you know, just the use of technology to to ensure that we're 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 trying to focus on the right areas uh, and and going about addressing these crimes. Uh, and we've also engaged um, um, some other resources to assist with us uh, in these uh, addressing these crimes. We had uh, a couple different uh, um, uh, time frames where we used task force, uh, we used Henry County or State Patrol or other resources to assist us um, uh, in, in addressing some of these crimes. Uh, we had one that uh, was in um, end of December into January that uh, end up resulting in 56 arrests over a weekend. So um, we have used some of those uh, um, uh, other agencies um, to assist us in response to some of these crimes. But uh, again, it's uh, ensuring that we have the resources uh, and the data to back up where we need to have the resources focused on to address some of those crimes. Uh, thank you for that, Chief. Um, and I have a, another question for you. Um, one of our community members asked, what changes um, to public safety our current first responders would like to see? Uh, well, I think the biggest thing, obviously, is the the challenge of resources. Um, you know, we 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 have had a lot of people that, um, for given whatever reasons, uh, and again, it's been publicly documented, is that we've seen people leave. So, um, I think our biggest thing is just ensuring that we have uh, enough people to to work at our different precincts or different units uh, to to be able to focus do the job. So, um, you know, we give them expectations. We give them um, um, goals, we give them things we'd like them to do, uh, we'd like to focus on, but sometimes the resources is, is the biggest challenge. Um, so we do everything we can to try to give them that uh, and getting those resources back up to uh, where we believe uh, they can effectively do that job uh, is one of the big things. Um, we give them the support they need to get that job done to, to, to do what we ask them to do. Um, and, uh, and I think uh, the other big thing is just uh, ensuring that we are uh, taking care of them. Um, um, again, one of the big things I, I think, uh, I'm not sure if I mentioned last time, one of the big things I'm focusing on is employee wellness. Our, all our employees, both our sworn and, and civilian employees, to ensure that they are, uh, um, uh, that they come to work refreshed to be able to do the job, being, bring their A game to do what we ask them to do. Um, and that means taking care of themselves, both mentally and physically and emotionally. Um, uh, to be able to do that job. Um, um, we have really uh, focused on being able to give them some resources to be able to do that, uh, uh, to try to um, um, give them the assistance they may need, the uh, help they may need, um, and uh, uh, to, to be able to come to work and, and, and uh, complete those, those um, expectations that we ask them to do. Thank you for that, Chief. Um, sorry here, just trying to pull another question. Um, someone asked what the Office of, Violent, uh, Office of Violence Prevention's role is um, in helping with response to um, the drug crisis. Um, 
and um, how are we involved um, with supporting um, some of the work around the opioid crisis? Uh, Director Cotton. Oh, okay, I'm unmuted. Uh, yes, thank you for that question. So we have been very careful in the Office of Violence Prevention to not criminalize drug use or abuse, but we do recognize that there are intersections um, and that there are you know, co-occurring issues. And so right now we do actually have an intern in our office who is looking very specifically at those intersections um, of violence prevention and opioid, the opioid crisis, as well as um, mental health. We're really excited about that work. And also in the health department, there is a group of people who are currently working on the issues of um, the opioid crisis and its connection to homelessness. So that work lives outside of the Office of Violence Prevention, but we do coordinate very closely with them. And that work is directed by our deputy director in the health department, Noya Woodridge. So the work is definitely something that we're evaluating and think is very important, but we do believe it deserves its own separate focus and shouldn't be absorbed in the Office of Violence Prevention to avoid criminalizing um, drug abuse and addiction. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, and don't go too far. I'm going to ask another question for you. Um, and this is around um, the interrupter teams. Um, will the interrupter teams operate under their own branding or are they going to be required um, to have the city's orange uniform um, once deployed this year in 2021? So we are following the advice of care violence and requiring a consistent uniform. So we want to have a consistent look for the interrupters so that when people see them in community, they're easily recognizable and they're easily tied back to the city's initiative of the violence interrupter program. The explicits about what the uniform will look like is yet to be determined and will likely be um, developed in partnership with care violence and the teams once they're selected but there will be some form of a uniform for all the teams universally. Thank you for that. Um, I think that there have been several questions in the chat about um, the OPCR um, and um, Assistant Chief Halverson. I'm wondering if you may be able to um, help with some of these. Um, I think it's around, I guess, the, the discipline rate, um, and maybe you can speak a little bit to the difference between um, discipline and coaching um, and why coaching is not considered discipline um, and included um, in the overall, um, the, I guess, the rate um, of the numbers that we see from the OPCR. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, it's important to remember that um, the OPCR, Office of Police Conduct, they work out of Civil Rights Division. Uh, important to remember that um, they, what their role is, is simply to investigate allegations. So they, uh, re they receive the allegations of misconduct, they do the review, uh, they do the investigation, and then they have another arm within uh, the OPCR as a police conduct review panel which is currently a, a panel that consists of two um, either commanders and inspectors and two civilian people that are uh, selected by um, the uh, OPCR and mayor's office. So these, two pa these four panelist members review the investigation, review the allegations, and they make a determination on, on the um, uh, findings uh, of fact regarding those allegations, deciding whether there's merit or no merit to the allegations. So after that, it, that um, um, after that's completed, their process is done. So they do not make determination on discipline. Per state statute, the chief is the only one who can make the determination on discipline. So after they, uh, after they complete their investigation, the, the case is then routed to the chief to make the decision on discipline. So um, um, uh, <clears throat> the cases they can review, the cases that they, uh, the police conduct review panel uh, will review our administrative cases, meaning cases that have gone to investigation. Um, there are also allegations that can go to coaching, and uh, um, these coaching um, uh, these coaching cases are lower level violations. Uh, they're usually um, so I, I, the 
prime example I give is if an officer didn't give their name or badge number uh, to a citizen who requested it. That is a lower level um, coaching violation. So, uh, uh, or coaching allegation. So the, the, the documentation for that would go to the officer's supervisor. Uh, they would talk to them about it and then they would coach them on, um, uh, find out whether it happened, uh, whether it occurred and then make a determination and then uh, decide to coach them on this incident or not. So um, it's, it, it's been a certain determination that uh, coaching is not discipline. Um, it is simply uh, almost like performance mentoring is what we kind of look at it as. Uh, that, determine, that determination was made long before I got into this position or long before I got into this role. Um, um, coachings have been occurring since uh, back in the uh, late 90s when they were called the uh, PPIs, uh, policy procedure inquiries. So, um, but again, it's it, it lower level violations where it's more of a performance management, performance mentoring issue with our employees, uh, not deemed as discipline. Um, whereas the bigger allegations or cases that, that turn into administrative investigations uh, can result in discipline. Um, thank you for that, Chief. Um, and have another question for you. Um, a question from the chat um, around um, some of the drug dealing and use um, in neighborhoods um, recently and officers who responded told us that they um, no longer have a narcotics unit. Um, the question is around um, how will MPD address drug related crimes um, and, and what is the work happening around that? Yeah, so um, we, we do not have a narcotics unit. We have not had one for a while. Uh, I wanna say it's probably been about um, six, seven years since we have uh, 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 disbanded our narcotics unit. Um, however, we do have um, our, our precinct uh, uh, community response team, their CRT teams. Um, so um, what they uh, have been um, tasked with is um, they have been uh, uh, primarily focus on investigations with uh, uh, um, issues that are addressing um, uh, neighborhoods, they're addressing businesses, they're stress, uh, addressing things that are on the street, issues on the street. So drug, and a lot of what they deal with is they deal with the drug narcotics investigations. Um, so they will work on these investigations um, and continue to work on, on these investigations. So we currently have uh, two re community response teams. Uh, the first precinct downtown has one uh, and the fourth precinct has one um, uh, uh, where they will work uh, in tandem on some of these uh, uh, um, investigations into drugs and uh, street uh, uh, narcotics. Uh, so um, we do still have, gather information from that and, and they, they target those uh, types of crimes or those types of incidents. Great, thank you, Chief, um, appreciate that. Um, okay, and one more for you, and then I promise I will give you a little break here. Um, uh, one question in the chat about staffing. Um, how does the staffing of MPD compare now to how it was um, in early 2020? Yeah, so it has been publicly documented um, on the issues or the, um, um, the, the number of staff that we have lost. So uh, uh, over the last year, uh, for a myriad of reasons, um, uh, we had, uh, um, again, we're authorized at a strength, we have been authorized at a strength of 888 uh, for a long time. Um, Pre-COVID and, and pre-George uh, uh, Floyd, we were hovering around that number, uh, we were close. Um, but since then it has gone down dramatically. Um, we are probably down around 200 people. Um, um, and, and again, this is a, a part of the reason we have went to the city council and, and they've authorized us to do hiring for this year. So um, um, it, it has been difficult. Uh, again, uh, it's really put us um, uh, behind the eight ball to be able to ensure that we focus on the public safety. Um, but we are working um, um, on everything we can do to try to get that number back up. 
to ensure that we have the resources to um, um, to do our job to be able to, to protect the, the citizens of Minneapolis. Thank you for that, Chief. Um, and maybe just pull um, one more here uh, for the group. Um, and I will um, actually throw this to Director Cotton um, just to speak a little bit more of the different partnerships that the OVP has uh, with community. Um, and, and to the work that we um, have uh, collaboratively and what are some opportunities um, that community members or organizations can plug in. Uh, thanks for that question, Jen. So we are really deeply focused on engaging with partners as uh, deeply tied to the community as possible. With our evidence-based work, it really is about a replication of service. And so the partners that come into our relationships um, to do that kind of work, we are really asking them to take the best of what we have learned from uh, national practice and implement it. And then where we think we can really grow the community's capacity and the community's brilliance, because we know there is brilliance in community and that evidence-based practice is not the only way to interrupt and prevent violence. We're also really focused on two key areas around capacity building, training, and investing in community. And that is through our Blueprint Approved Institute where we are training uh, with three cohorts right now, small grassroots agencies. Um, in each of those cohorts, there are eight agencies who have a budget of less than $100,000. We're providing them with about $50,000 worth of training and really focused on building their capacity to do ongoing violence prevention work in Minneapolis. And this week, hopefully, if not early next week, an RFP for the Office of Violence Prevention Fund will be released. Those are grants uh, ranging from 10 to $50,000 that agencies can apply for to receive funds to do already existing work that they believe is interrupting patterns of violence in Minneapolis. And so those are two key ways that we're working with a large pool of partners. In addition to the ongoing partnerships that we have through our evidence-based work, we are also in key deep relationships with Minneapolis public schools, Minneapolis parks, who are closely with the county and probation, both in juvenile and adult. We are always interested in expanding that network, whether that be through traditional means and a competitive RFP or RFA process, or really looking at ways that we can work with other jurisdictions. We do have a steering committee and we'll be looking at ways to recruit new members for that as well. Um, so there's lots of ways to be involved and we're uh, really looking forward to as the COVID restrictions get lifted, being able to get back in community and really do that valuable work. Not that it has ceased, but it's certainly been difficult during the pandemic. Uh, thank you for that, Director. Um, and I would like to take a moment and just shift um, to a couple other items that I wanted to be sure that we mentioned on this meeting tonight. Um, and the first is that this meeting was recorded. Um, we will be making this available on our website um, for folks to view after the fact um, and to share with those who may or may not um, have been able to attend tonight. Um, we will also do our best to continue to answer some of the questions um, offline. You are free to reach out to us anytime. Um, our email is communitysafety at minneapolismn.gov. Um, and we also recently were able to get on um, Gov Delivery. I know that folks have been sending emails to the community safety inbox um, asking to subscribe for updates. Um, and you are more than welcome to continue to do that. Um, and we will be sharing um, more updates uh, with you all as the work continues um, through Gov Delivery. Um, and once that is all set, there will be um, a, a link on our webpage that you can sign up there also, um, as well as when you're ever in um, kind of uh, the, the system of, of government and selecting different topics that you want to stay engaged on, um, we will have um, a, an option there for folks to plug into as well. Um, it took just a minute to get some of my um, permissions switched over um, to, to this new body of work um, so that I'm able to share um, updates through Gov Delivery with everyone. 
Um, also coming up uh, this month, um, we will be having a learning lab series um, with national experts, as well as some of our local experts and city staff on specific topics um, to do more of a deep dive um, into uh, topics related to um, public safety and community safety. Um, so please look for that to come. Um, and those will be offered varying times during the day. Um, and in the evening, we acknowledge that um, everyone has different schedules um, and family commitments, work commitments. Um, so we would like to be mindful of that and make sure that we're offering opportunities for people to plug in um, various times of the day and days of the week. Um, and um, in addition to that, um, as the spring turns, we are hoping to get out um, and do some in-person engagement with folks, um, of course, with safety precautions, um, masks and social distancing. Um, so please um, just stay tuned um, for more um, updates and opportunities for you all to plug in. Um, I really wanna take a moment to thank um, in particular our translators um, who have spent their evening with us um, providing accessibility to community members. I want to thank all of our panelists here um, and also the staff, um, city staff who has um, been working tirelessly on these issues um, day in and day out. Um, really wanna show our appreciation for you. Um, and then of course, all of our community members. Um, we appreciate you all taking the time this evening um, to come and hear from all of us about some of the work that's happening. Um, and we look forward to uh, continuing on this journey with you all. Um, with that being said, um, we were going to go ahead and uh, bring this meeting to a close um, and we'll be in touch uh, with more opportunities to engage soon. So thank you everyone, really appreciate you all being here tonight.